Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy. And I'm Pastor Chris Johnson. This is your word at the middle of the week, and we are studying the virgin birth. That teaching of the Christian church that many people like to treat as optional, uh, that others scoff at and say, couldn't be, couldn't be. But we confess is, in fact, the way that our Lord Jesus Christ entered the world. And so these past few weeks, we've looked at some of the objections to the virgin birth and discussed those. We've also looked at some of the other births in Scripture uh, in the Old Testament and how they're both different from the virgin birth and how they lead up to the virgin birth. One point we should probably make here at the beginning of the uh, session today that we had meant to talk about earlier, and I don't think we ever did, was to clarify some terminology. Uh, the virgin birth in classical Christian discussion, the virgin birth of Jesus, is different from the immaculate conception. Mm. And people sometimes confuse the two and think the immaculate conception is referring to Jesus and the virgin birth. The immaculate conception in classical Christian theology is a phrase that was applied to the conception of Mary when some Christians began teaching that Mary was conceived without sin. Mm -hmm. The idea being that Mary had to be without sin in order to bear the Savior. In fact, there is a, a teaching out there, uh, current in the, in the Christian church today, and for many centuries, that there was a strain of humanity that was preserved from sin throughout history from which Saint Mary came. And that she was, born, I don't know if it's through Joachim and, or Anna, those are her, the, the names of her traditional parents according to, you know, pious, uh, pious legend. But um, that's, that's the teaching. However, as we said, and this is why it's important to recognize that the virgin birth does not necessarily mean that our Lord Jesus Christ assumed any of his flesh, or to put it in today's terminology, DNA from the Virgin Mary, right? Uh, we've talked about this a little bit already. The scriptures don't say that exactly. She, she con he was conceived of the Virgin Mary. Does that mean that he you know, inherited her genes or whatever. Uh, I think that that's something the scriptures don't get into. Uh, and certainly it also is troublesome from the perspective of biblical theology to say that someone has to be sinless to bear the Savior. Because, of course, we bear the Savior today. Uh, the scriptures are very clear that those who trust in Christ are temples of the Holy Spirit, if temples of the Holy Spirit, then also uh, members of the body of Christ, for Christ is that temple. If we are joined to Christ flesh to flesh and bone to bone, if we receive him at his Holy Supper, that's almost, I would say, a more intimate union than being, than bear, being, than, than the union he had with Mary as, as by virtue of his birth. And we're not sinless. And the whole point is that this sinless Man, who is also God of the universe, who became flesh for us, and who brought his sinlessness into our world, into our flesh, mm -hmm. um, is in fact uniting himself with sinners. And so uh, to insist that Mary be sinless, to insist that some strand of humanity was kept sinless in order to bring forth Mary, in order to bring forth Jesus, I think really misses the point. Mm -hmm. Uh, entirely of the whole Christ event, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, Go so, and, and certainly it, it does have you know the the best in mind in regards to both Jesus and Mary, right? I mean, Jesus was clearly sinless, uh, and so to you can kind of understand where they might have come from from that to you know preserve the the sanctity of Jesus, but also by extent Mary, since Mary was. Um, definitely an object of, of worship for some of those medieval Christians, especially, which Luther tried to get away from, right? Luther highly revered Mary. Uh, but yeah, there are some things that just aren't held by scripture and cannot be mandatory for the Christian faith. 
uh, which modern the modern Catholic Church does make dogma, uh, which means if you don't believe this, yeah. you're not a Catholic, you're not saved. And the Immaculate Conception is one of those. The Assumption of Mary is another one of those. It's a big assumption. Yeah, it's, it is a big assumption. Uh, and so Luther had a high reverence for Mary, um, but there were things that were said about Mary back in those days that just weren't tenable from Scripture. Maybe a, a fine, pious legend, uh, but to make binding on the conscience, no, that, that, that cannot be done. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and it just, and also kind of, I think it helps contribute, and this would be a problem, but that teaching that in order to bear the Savior, Mary herself had to be sinless, contributes this idea of a hierarchy, that, that, that sinners have to get up this hierarchy mm -hmm. to a certain point of sinless, sinlessness before they are mm -hmm. fully, until, and before they are full of grace. Right, yeah, it's definitely tied to the Catholic, Roman Catholic system of, of grace, climbing mm -hmm. the ladder, climbing the steps. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and instead of, of what Scripture proclaims, which is, that, which is that all that grace came down to us in our deaths at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, and, you know, I think, and, and it doesn't steal, and it does not steal anything. It, it steals no honor from Mary to say that she is a sinner. It's not that we have to think up sins for her, as, <laughs> as one Lutheran theologian put it. It also does not mean that only most generations shall call her blessed. It means that all generations shall call her the blessed Virgin Mary. That's what she prophesies in Scripture. And so we accept that. Uh, she is blessed. But the question is, why is she honored? Why is she blessed? Why is she venerable? And the answer is because of the grace and favor shown to her. Um, and, and indeed, maybe if we're more upfront about teaching that we honor and venerate, uh, venerate meaning essentially honor, remember with thanksgiving, um, Mary, for that reason, for the grace and favor shown to her, maybe that will teach us also to honor and venerate one another when we remember the grace that is shown to one another. And maybe it will help us become actually uh, better Christians to, to, to have that teaching. Because, of course, you know, if you think about it, you think about the consequence, if you venerate someone because they're sinless, if you honor someone because they're sinless, and then you're surrounded by all these sinners, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you have less reason to honor and venerate them, the living among you, right? Because they're not sinless. They're not like the one that you're taught to honor and venerate because she's sinless. But let's honor and venerate her because she has been shown such favor, even in the midst of the shared sinful humanity that she has with us. Again, it doesn't take anything away from her. Mm -hmm. It actually gives her more and it helps us give each other more. Yeah. Um, that's just so, so that distinction, if you hear the if reference to the Immaculate Conception, that's not referring to Jesus. That's classically referring to a pious legend, um, a, a pious belief, but not one um, especially supported by scripture. Uh, that that Mary was conceived immaculately. Um, if if she, if he would if he would put his flesh and blood upon sinful tongues today, there would be nothing to prevent him from forming himself within a sinful womb. Absolutely nothing, and it's absolutely beautiful to confess that it is so. All right, so I was going to share something from Colossians, but we've talked quite a bit about that now. I, what I was going to share from Colossians, just very briefly, is chapter 1, starting at verse 15, this reference <clears throat> to Christ being the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
Another thing that people will sometimes do is they'll start talking about Jesus as though he's different from the Son of God. And they'll say, well, the Son of God, you know, he sort of pre-existed and floated around with the Father before creation and floated around with Israel and, and was sort of hiddenly present and very so. And but now Jesus has come and, and Jesus wasn't really Jesus didn't really exist before all things. This is very clear. Mm -hmm. Jesus existed with the Father before all things. Everything was created through him. And so to call him the firstborn of creation, I, as I think about it more and, and listen to the scriptures more, it, you know, it's definitely not saying that, well, when, when, when things were created, he was made first. Uh, Which is what the Arians would say 1,800 years ago, and what modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses mm -hmm. and Mormons would say. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they, they both talk today because they're present-day Gnostics and, and Arians. We'll talk about the word Arian in a moment. Who, yeah, they say Jesus was part of creation. He's a creature. Yep. A highly exalted creature, but a creature, a creature nonetheless. nonetheless. Yeah. And so Arians are not, sometimes you hear that term in reference to Nazis, right? That Nazis believe in the Aryan mm -hmm. race. With a that, Y, Aryan with a Y. Yeah, that's spelled A-R-Y-A-N. That is something different. Mm -hmm. It has to do with theories of, of the spread of nations and the Indo-Europeans and all that. But Arians in Christian theology, spelled A-R-I-A-N-S, refers to followers of a man named Arius, who was a arch presbyter or archdeacon in the pretty, Alexandrian church. Pretty high-ranking official, I believe Rome. Was he in Rome? I think he was in Rome. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, and, uh, you know, his main nemesis was Athanasius, mm -hmm. and uh, who was an archbishop of, of Alexandria. And he was teaching that God, that Jesus is a creature, maybe a mixture, um, that he did not, that there was a time when Jesus was not. Mm -hmm. This is speaking differently. And I, 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 when I hear firstborn of creation, that doesn't necessarily refer to something in the past before Jesus, uh, before, before even the birth, the, the, the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem. I mean, I, to me, that describes his birth at Bethlehem also. By being born at Bethlehem, he becomes the firstborn of all creation because he's so preeminent mm -hmm. in all things because he existed before the world existed. Because all things were made through him and for him, he's the firstborn of all creation uh, in that as we look back um, in history, we see that Jesus, Jesus is the eternal God. So that's just amazing to think about what we're going to celebrate in a few days, that the eternal God came and dwelt among us. For today, we're going to read, go say, go say something. Yeah, and, and Paul will later say, to connect what we uh, talked about a little bit earlier, Paul will talk about the mystery, what, one of the greatest mysteries revealed, the mystery of Christ in you. Yeah. Uh, he'll go on to talk about that a little bit later in Colossians chapter 2, I think it is. So, um, connecting incarnation also to the life of the believer. Right. And, of course, <laughs> then he also goes on to say, interestingly enough, in chapter 3, you're in Christ. Mm -hmm. You're hidden in Christ. Again, the union is, is profound, yeah. and, um, and it's a union with sinners. So what we're going to talk about today is just go through the readings of, in, in Luke, the readings of the Gospels that talk about the virgin birth, and in particular, we find them in Luke. And we, because of our timing today, we're going to, there's a lot we could do, but I think what we'll do is we'll jump into chapter 1, verse 26. And Pastor Johnson, would you please read in Luke 1, uh, starting at verse 26, all the way through 38. Sure. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. 
he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. I was reading a reflection on this uh, passage yesterday, quite by accident, written by one of my former professors uh, at my undergraduate college, who he's also a Lutheran pastor. His name is Frederick Niedner. Um, I don't know if he's still a Lutheran pastor. He uh, traveled a, a different road, I think. I think he's still a Lutheran pastor. I'm just not sure how that all turned out for him. But anyway, he had a really interesting reflection on this, which I thought was really good. Um, he, uh, he said, you know, Gabriel came to Zechariah. And that was a difficult interaction. Yes. Uh, Zechariah didn't believe Gabriel when Gabriel said, your wife Elizabeth is going to bear a son, John the Baptist, as a result. Zechariah, Gabriel responds with some offense uh, and says, you can almost hear him say, I'm Gabriel. You know, I stand in the presence of God. What, what are you, what, why are you responding to me this way? You're going to be silent. Yeah. Because you talk too much. You talk too much. You're going to be silent. <laughs> silent yeah. Well, okay. Uh, as uh, Pastor Needner's reflection was, if you think proposing marriage is difficult, Called young men, imagine being an angel and having to go and propose pregnancy hmm. to a teenage girl. Uh, teenage girls, you know, they're not necessarily e easy to talk to either, right? And so he comes and, <laughs> and he, in the way he interprets it, he goes, you know, he comes and he says, greeting, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she's troubled, but then he explains his proposal and she says, in essence, Angel, don't you realize how this works? Yeah. How can that be? She's been to biology class. She's been to biology class. And so then he says, in order to give himself strength, he essentially sings to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That is lyrical uh, speech. Because it's if you think about the Psalms, the Psalms will often say something and then the next line will say it again in a different way. That's their form of rhyme. That's their form of poetry. It's their form of song. And so essentially, Gabriel the angel sings, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's the first part of the verse and the second part. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be called, <laughs> to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God, which is also a lyrical verse. It's basically two lines saying the same thing in a different way. He'll be called Holy. He'll be called the Son of God. And besides, your cousin, and besides, your relative Elizabeth is also pregnant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he says, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary's answer, uh, upon which all the angels were doting and, and, and for which the whole creation hushed, was whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Right? Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the teenage, the, the ancient teenage version of... Mm. Whatever. <laughs> uh, which we may find some offense at that because it seems like it's sort of belittling her gracious response. And yet there is a little bit of whatever in the Christian faith. Isn't there? It's like, oh, okay. I prayed for this. I got this. Okay. So we trust God. Whatever. We trust God. We, we, we turn to the cross. Absolutely. And, and I mean, Luther even touches on that very thing in the small catechism when he's talking about the Lord's Prayer. You know, mm -hmm. thy will be done. Um, yeah, thy will be done. Whatever. Mm -hmm. whatever, your, whatever you will mm -hmm. be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So 
Mary was a good Lutheran then. Yeah, oh, of course. I mean, that's, there's a reason why we're Lutherans. It's not just sort of cultural and ethnic. I mean, it's, I mean, we believe, we're Lutherans because we believe, Pastor Johnson was raised Roman Catholic, right? Um, Pastor Johnson's raised Roman Catholic. I'm raised in a Lutheran church that's um, a bit more, you know, um, maybe pietist, evangelical in some of its thought. But, but we're Lutheran because we believe this is what Scripture says. And so absolutely, she's a, she's a good Lutheran here. <laughs> um, she accepts what, what the promises are. She, she takes the promises that are given as they are given. So this explains how the virgin birth happens, though. As much of an explanation as we are given is very clear. Well, how can this be? Don't you know how this works, Gabriel? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's it. Mm -hmm. So what do we have to say about that? Yeah. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Are there any other connections there in Scripture? Mm -hmm. I, we definitely can see a connection to, <clears throat> to Genesis with the Holy Spirit hovering over the, the mm -hmm. chaotic creation to be, as it were. And, and in the very beginning, it says, and the, the Spirit hovered over the deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is in like the first two verses of Genesis. Yeah. And so there in Genesis, we have Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit all at work. The Father speaks his word. The word became incarnate in Jesus Christ. There's the Holy Spirit. And here in the incarnation, the Father sends the angel of the Lord. The, the angel speaks. The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary. And Mary gives birth to the Son of God in her womb. So uh, Trinitarian as well. We, we can definitely say that this here is mm. the Trinity at work um, quite clearly again. Um, moving on the next stage of redemption with was Jesus uh, to be born through the virgin's womb. The, the promised seed that would crush the serpent's head mm. that we also hear from Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, Genesis chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So some pretty strong Genesis themes here, undertones. Very strong Genesis themes. The, the spirit hovering, the term used there in the Hebrew is a term for brooding. And so uh, it's similar to the word used for chickens or hens, brooding. Uh, over their chicks, their eggs, and so the spirit is a brooder, and here the spirit is brooding over Mary, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's this creative element, and you can just kind of see the, the spirit hovering, like a, the feathers of the spirit hovering uh, over, over the creation, over Mary, but then also we can think of the presence of the Lord overshadowing and hovering over the tabernacle. Right? Oh, definitely from Exodus. The yeah. Spirit comes and, and fills the tabernacle, mm -hmm. the presence, the Shekinah, the presence of God comes and fills it, all yeah. tightly associated with the Holy Spirit there. And so the brooding over creation from which, forth, from which comes forth a great new creation, the brooding over or the filling of the tabernacle, um, which comes as part of a new covenant mm -hmm. and a new life for Israel. And now also the overshadowing of Mary, from which comes our Savior. And then we could also say the Holy Spirit descending upon the church at Pentecost, yep. upon the apostles, Absolutely. from which comes the new birth and new life, the new, the new Testament, the new covenant of, um, of the church's proclamation of the gospel. So, um, yeah, I, there's 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 connections here to the rest of Scripture, and in and in as much as the life of the church is a mystery, in as much as the abiding life of Israel for thousands of years is a mystery, as much as creation itself is a mystery, so also is the virgin birth, and what we're given is well, it's the Holy Spirit, uh, which is you know, more than what science can give us about creation, ultimately. You just never can get beyond, can never get behind the, the, the simple observation that creation is. It's the Holy Spirit. And in so much as we believe in a, this is a point you made, it was really great a couple of weeks earlier, in, in as much as we believe in a virgin creation, here we see again the virgin birth, yeah. virgin creation of of the flesh of Christ. So, uh, and then that also, Martin Luther at one point applied this to the Holy Supper. 
and said, well, this happens through the word. I mean, if the spirit is hovering over and brooding over and filling Mary, then, um, then the word is as well, because the word and the spirit are like this, always together. And so he would point out that in creation, when the spirit's there, quickly upon the spirit's presence comes the word, let there be light. Mm -hmm. Quickly upon the filling of the tabernacle, there comes the, the oracles and worship of Israel. Quickly upon the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, the church begins preaching. The Word and the Spirit always are accompanying each other. Well, here also, through the Word, Mary is made pregnant. Through the Word, the body and blood of Christ are present at Holy Communion. Absolutely. Yeah. So our altars today are like, are like the church, they're like Mary, they're like creation, they're like the tabernacle. They are where the Spirit is giving us that new flesh of the yeah. new creation. Driving us to Jesus and giving us Jesus, like mm -hmm. Jesus himself said uh, back in John, uh, John's Gospel, John 14, 15, 16, this is the work of the Spirit to point to, to Jesus, to point to the Word. Yeah. So now let's look at the actual birth. I mean, again, there's so much more we could talk about, the beautiful visitation between Mary and Elizabeth. We could, we could talk about the timing of all this. Uh, for example, in verse 26, in the sixth month, that's often taken to mean the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, from which then comes the belief that the Annunciation or the uh, conception of Jesus happens in March. Some traditions said late, later April, um, or early April, later in early April. But in the spring, in March, comes the conception of Jesus. Therefore, the birth of Jesus in December or the beginning of January, from which we get the Feast of Epiphany. Uh, and so, in the 12 days of Christmas. And so there's some things we could say here about timing and about um, the church year, but let's move to chapter two, the actual virgin birth. And Pastor, could you read verses one through seven of chapter two? Yep. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Thank you. At one time during the, some of you remember the Kosovo, the Serbian-Kosovo war and how America became involved in that in the late 1990s. I remember watching a, a news report of that that showed a, I believe it was probably a Kosovar soldier coming home and he came home to this very traditional family, a very traditional small rural neighborhood of Kosovo and he is shown his baby that's been born for the first time mm. and the baby, they just start passing this oblong package down the line of the family. I'm like, what is that? Is it, you know, it looks like a loaf of bread. And what it is, is it's a baby in swaddling cloths. And so the baby was so tightly wrapped mm -hmm. in swaddling cloths, just bound, bound up, that, I mean, the baby, the baby couldn't move. The baby just looked like a little loaf of bread, <laughs> a very, really stiff loaf of bread. And so that gives us a good sense of what that looked like. It wasn't that he was snuggled in a, you know, these warm, fuzzy blankets and and then laid and snuggled in hay, necessarily. But he was bound. He was wrapped up tight. That's what you did for babies. In a world where there are open fires, in a world where there are animals that roam free, in a world where accidents happen, you keep the baby safe by keeping the baby bound. And many people will connect that with his eventual binding on the cross and his binding in the tomb and in the grave clothes. But we're looking specifically at the virgin birth. So, and I've also been told or heard that it was uh, a common peasant practice. Oh. Not so much of the upper 
echelons of society, but what rural folk did, you know, what normal people did. Oh, okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So that kind of ties in with the Kosovar. Yeah, well. absolutely. A rural, rural mm -hmm. guy with that passing the football around. Sure, you have no, you have no servant to tend the child. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to find some other way yep. to, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So what does this teach us about the virgin birth, Pastor? Mm -hmm. What this teaches us about the virgin birth was that, well, it happened. Um, the angel said, Mary, you will have a child, and the impossible was made possible by the Holy Spirit, just as the angel said, and Jesus was born. Uh, Jesus was born, and there were eyewitnesses there, just like the, there were eyewitnesses at his cross, but also at his resurrection. Uh, there was Mary, and also, uh, no doubt, Joseph was there, though we're not exactly sure. Um, Likely David was there because after all they, they went there. Uh, sometimes the guys in, in uh, ancient uh, birthing practices, often the males would be excused from the room. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe David was there right away. Maybe he came a little later. Uh, maybe he wasn't there. We're not quite sure. But there was Mary. There jo was, Joseph. Or Joseph. I'm sorry, not yeah. David, but Joseph. Uh, there's Mary, there's Joseph, and also the people who housed them, uh, who opened their homes to them, though there wasn't any room for them elsewhere, uh, at the inn or the uh, upper room is another way to translate that word, yeah, I think. the guest room. The guest room. Um, there no doubt would have been someone there, a midwife, to help Mary, uh, because that was just, just, that's just what you did back in those days. You opened your homes. Hospitality uh, was huge, and, and so Mary likely would have been doted on upon other by others and who these people are we don't know um but god knows who they are and and there jesus is born and the word of god has come to pass what god said uh god did and what god promised god made happen and there is jesus who is born the firstborn son um she who was a virgin uh has given birth and so he is so much a virgin birth that his lineage is traced through his father who has nothing to contribute to this birth at mm -hmm. all, Joseph. We've talked about that before. Yeah. And that was told to Mary in the announcement from Gabriel that he would inherit the throne of David. Does that mean that Mary descended from David? We're never told that. We are told Joseph did. Joseph who contributed nothing to this birth except to accept it. And in and this is this is also great Lutheran theology, uh, in trusting, in receiving this gift, in trusting this gift by trusting this gift of Jesus by receiving this gift of Jesus as his own. Mm -hmm. Joseph is given this baby as his own, and so this baby inherits all that Joseph is. This baby absorbs and takes and assumes all that Joseph is. Mm -hmm. That's significant, I think. And uh, this prefigures how Christ takes and assumes all that we are, including our sin. And that by receiving this gift of Christ, we receive him as our own. Not just that we are owned by him, but he also, in some sense, is owned by us. Mm -hmm. He absorbs from us all that we are, just as he does with J Joseph. And that's really glorious. Yeah, and to use a a term that Luther was would, would love to use. He would often like to use that term, that the happy exchange or, mm -hmm. or blessed exchange. Uh, and usually he would attach it to, you know, the cross where Jesus absorbs all of our sin and we receive all that he has, righteousness, purity, and everything. But ultimately, all the life of Christ is that, uh, a blessed exchange of him taking us and ours and giving his uh, to us. Uh, we receive all that he has to give, and Joseph being one of the first, to receive Jesus as he is, and yeah. uh, even though he is not his biological son, nevertheless, Jesus is is his son. And Joseph, uh, as a wonderful guardian, he's often called a guardian in, in Christian history and legend, uh, not legend, but um, in tradition. Christian, tradition, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he just receives Christ as his own. And so just a wonderful, wonderful thing for Joseph um, and also a wonderful thing for, um, uh, for those called to be step-parents, I think, too, you know, that that can be a very... Or adoptive or, parents. Or adoptive parents as well, step-parents, adoptive parents, where you are caring for one that is not biologically yours, but you still receive it as yours um, because it is, because mm -hmm. you love that child as your own.
And it's precisely the virgin birth that makes this strangely possible for Jesus to inherit all that Joseph is and then all that we are as well, because he does not belong to any particular family in the way that we understand that. He belongs to all. This also helps us understand Christian art. People, you know, very much um, rail against, uh, have railed against recently, by recently I mean the last 30, 40, 50 years, uh, presentations of Christ in stained glass windows and European art as a blonde Christ or a light brown haired Christ, a white skinned Christ, sometimes even a blue skin, a blue eyed Christ. And people go, well, that's not right. He shouldn't be portrayed that way. But of course, when you go to Japan or to China or to Mexico or to uh, Africa, you'll find an African Christ. You'll find a Mexican Christ. You'll find a Japanese and a Chinese Christ. Every culture portrays Christ as having absorbed all that that culture is. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. That's part of the virgin birth. Uh, it, remains a, it, may, it remains a virginal birth for eternity. Uh, because, because Christ is risen and he, you can't undo the fact that he's virgin born. And so he remains truly a, if we can put it this way, a clean slate for every culture. Not that cultures can just co-opt him and make him affirm all that their culture is. That's not the point. He actually brings a critique to every culture, but it's a critique made in the midst of assuming the people of that culture as members of his body. So beautiful thing uh, that happens here. We're going to celebrate that this weekend. Mm -hmm. This weekend, that's what we are giving thanks for and praising God for is this amazing gift. We should never shy away from it. We should never be embarrassed by this teaching. It is um, a te again, I, I would say to you, if you ever have conversations or th thoughts about this in company where people go, that's a bunch of silly hokum, it, it, I think that that analogy of to creation, we don't really know how creation was made or was made or came to be from a scientific perspective. We should therefore not be surprised if science cannot explain the virgin birth. Clearly, there's something science can't explain. They can't explain creation. Why should we expect science to explain the virgin birth? So never, there is a reasonableness to the virgin birth. There's a depth uh, to it. And, uh, and clearly there's a beautiful and a, a beauty and a gift to it. So next week, what I think we'll do, Pastor Johnson will not be here. Um, I think I might talk about one of the lingering questions that Christian theology has, which is, did Mary remain a virgin? We'll talk about that next week. Yeah, and why that does or does not matter. matter. Yeah, and what and what the Lutheran position on that is, which is a little different from every other position, precisely because we take Scripture at its word. So, Pastor, will you pray for us? Absolutely, let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks as always for the gift of your word and for the time and opportunity to dwell in your word, to listen, to learn, to be fed, to be nourished by your word and by your spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to feed and nourish us by your word and spirit as we come once again to receive this wonderful news of Christ being born for us and for our salvation through the womb of the Virgin. Bless all families as they celebrate this upcoming Christmas uh, holiday on Saturday night and Sunday morning, the joy of the Incarnation. May it be theirs as they uh, relish in this wonderful gift given to the world and also given to us specifically. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.